Welcome, welcome, welcome to the first inaugural kickoff session of the MIT Computational Law Reports monthly last Friday series of flash talks and discussion that we're tentatively calling Idea Flow. And I'm joined by MIT Computational Law Report editor in chief, our erstwhile co host for this event series, who is going to kind of introduce himself now and talk a little bit about very exciting updates and um, new initiatives emerging in the MIT Computational Law Report. And then we'll get right into the flash talks and discussion with all of you. So, with that, Brian, take it away. Hey, everybody. My name is Brian Wilson. I am the editor in chief of the MIT Computational Law Report. And I'm really excited today to see everybody's faces uh, after the IAP Computational Law course that just concluded and want to thank everybody who is in the audience who participated there because it was really tremendous. And we have some very exciting things that are uh, in the process of being developed in the form of a write-up of the course and in the form of some some papers and then in a form of everybody's uh, quad chart actually being included as a kind of slide in the final presentations. On top of that, though, we're also excited as a publication to announce a, a more a little bit more regular publishing cadence um, that is going to use these community building calls as an input so that we can keep the conversation rolling a little bit more throughout the years and also generate a lot of good impact and get a lot of good speakers in to talk and really highlight the, the great idea flow that comes out of this group. In addition to that, we are also going to be providing a little bit of a facelift to the um, website for the computational law report. So there are going to be a number of new features that we're trying out uh, in the form of collections um, of different ways that content is organized. We're also going to be hosting a number of new columns, which are kind of regular series from various contributors throughout the, uh, throughout the computational law space. And we're very, very excited for those. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm so excited that everybody here is going to be able to participate in kind of building that future together. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Daza. Very good, thank you so much, Brian. And I neglected to mention my name is, as you may have guessed, Daza Greenwood. Uh, I'm executive director at the MIT Computational Law Report and a, <clears throat> well, a long time researcher in the area of computational law at MIT. And you can learn more about all of that at law.mit.edu. So now let's do a little screen share. Okay, can you all see this screen? Great. Um, <clears throat> so we were doing a bit of a reprise of some of what we thought was very successful in the uh, recently concluded computational law course. And that is this flash talk um, segment of content. And uh, we've got two of the three flash talks um, lined up that you had seen um, during the class. But what we thought we wanted to do differently and as part of this series, this monthly series, is to have the flash talk be presented. So same there, but then actually provide a larger container of time to have discussions that are catalyzed by these ideas in these very brief talks. And so um, that's, and that's where we hope to catalyze the idea flow. <laughs> and so uh, with that, um, I'd like, it is my great pleasure to introduce Megan Ma, who's going to give us her flash talk on the legislative recipe, syntax for machine readable legislation. Okay, you're up, take it away. Hi everyone, uh, happy to be here again and happy to see so many familiar faces. Many, if not most of you have heard me speak about this already. So hopefully again today, we can have a deeper discussion on it. I contextualize this talk by noting the rather narrow framing. That is, I steer away from actually markup languages, standards, or the idea of machine readability as an intermediary model, thereby this differentiation between machine readable and machine executable. So without further ado, 
Machine readable legislation has received renewed popularity owed to the Rules as Code initiative. The fervor around Rules as Code was accelerated by the recent OECD Observatory of Public Sector Innovation Report titled Cracking the Code. This report articulates how machine consumable, defined as machines understanding and actioning rules consistently, reduces the need for individual interpretation and translation and helps ensure the implementation better matches the original intent. This methodology enables the government to produce logic expressed as a conceptual model, in effect, a blueprint of the legislation. So again, what are the attractions and what are its limits? I frequently turn to this example. Layman E. Allen lamented about ambiguity in legal drafting owed to syntactic uncertainties. In a fascinating study, he deconstructs an American patent statute and notices immediately the complexity with the word unless. He asks whether the inclusion of unless asserts a unidirectional or a bidirectional condition. That is, does the clause mean A, if not X, then Y, or B, if not X, then Y, and if X, then not Y? Though nuanced, Allen exposes an ambiguity that muddies the legal force of the statute. An interpretation of unless as a bidirectional condition raises the question of what not why would mean. In this particular case, this could affect whether exceptions are possible in determining patent eligibility. In short, for Allen, legislative language must have a clear structure. These ideas are not new. The ancestry dates back to 12th century logicians reflecting on the use of mathematically precise forms of writing. In the mid-1930s, German philosopher Rudolf Carnap reflected on logical syntax for language. His argument is that logic may be revealed through the syntactic structure of sentences. He suggests that the imperfections of natural language point instead to an artificially constructed symbolic language to enable increased precision. Simply put, it is treating language as a calculus. More recently, Stephen Wolfram made a similar argument. Simplification, he states, could occur through the formulation of a symbolic discourse language. That is, if the poetry of natural language could be crushed out, one could arrive at legal language that is entirely precise. Machine readability appears then to bridge the desire for precision with the inherent logic and ruleness of specific aspects of the law. In other words, a potential recipe to resolve the complexity of legalese. However, if a new symbolic language like code effectively enforces a controlled grammar, what are its implications as it moves across the legal ecosystem? In particular, its interactions with various legal sources. Machine readable legislation may therefore be regarded as a product that evolved out of the relationship between syntax, structure, and interpretation. One question is left fundamentally unanswered. What should be the role of machine readable legislation? Is it A, simply a coded version of the legislation? B, is it a parallel alternative, one that is legally authoritative? Or C, is it a domain model of regulation from which third parties derive their own versions akin to an open source code? These three scenarios, and though not exclusive, have their own sets of implications. And only in answering this question would a fruitful assessment of how logic syntax and symbolic language found in machine readable legislation are capable of representing legal knowledge. Thank you. Yay, <laughs> outstanding. Thank you so much for preparing those remarks. Um, I'd like to remind everybody, um, and I'm just putting a link in here, um, that the um, written remarks are, are also available for you to pour over and memorize and recite every morning in the mirror at this link that I've just provided. And, um, <clears throat> And with that, I think what we'd like to do is jump right into discussion of, of, this, of these ideas. And we'll um, then go to TMA, who will provide another lightning talk, followed by discussion, and then we'll wrap. OK, so with that, I have to turn to my co-host, Brian, to ask you what how shall, shall we just unmute everybody, do you think, or? The way that I would suggest we go about this is if anybody has a question, you can click the, I believe you can click the raise hand button. And from there we can um, ask you to unmute so that we can generate the conversation. Very good. And then I might just add one content part of that, which is um, questions for sure, but also 
primarily ideas. And so the questions arguably were partly laid out at the very end there with the three options. There may be other options, but if you have ideas on one of those options or pros and cons or none of the above or other ideas, now is the time to let the ideas flow. And I have a couple of ideas that we can get us started with. If, uh, if, if well, actually, first, let me just ask: Does everyone understand how to raise your hand? Um, I only learned this recently, but there's a little button that you can hit. Um, but what I was going to start with, and I don't mean to be like rude, uh, because the three questions are distinct and they offer different paths. But my basic question: Oh, I see Brian has his hand raised. It was just, why would it, wouldn't it be more likely that it would be all of the above and that there's different domains of uh, context and use where these would be explored and, you know, perhaps others as well, combinations and other ways that maybe the people haven't been born yet, who are going to make the real jurisprudential, you know, insightful breakthroughs about how to combine, you know, uh, this technology with law in the fullness of time. But for the, for the next, you know, call it three to five years, um, not all? What do you think? Yeah, 100%. That's a great question. I'm certainly not saying that it will be one model over another or that it's mutually exclusive. Um, I think that there are sort of nuances behind the implications. So for example, even just between a coded version versus the parallel authoritative, um, par a parallel alternative, it has different implications on the authority behind the machine readable version. So how I see it is um, in, the, in the idea that it's a parallel alternative, that the machine readable and the natural language version are equally authoritative, we might have to turn to ideas of bilingualism or bijuralism. And so I refer often to Canada as an example, A, because I am Canadian myself, um, but there has been concern in the past um, for legislation, say one written in English and one written in French. So we're conceiving of the machine readable version as another language. Um, so what has happened is that they've seized the courts according to the version that of course benefits them the most, even if there are differences in the types of translation. So this is sort of something that um, would be a different concern than if it was just a coded version, because if it was a coded version, then it's just considered an interpretation of the law as opposed to the interpretation by the machine readable version. So that's kind of what I'm trying to express here is that when we think about the various um, ways in which um, machine readable legislation could manifest itself, um, the different the one, two, or three, or so the th three different scenarios, they all have different sort of legal conclusions that can be drawn from it. Very good. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, before we go to Brian, you listening, what was that word you said? Um, Juris, or there was some word I'd never heard before. And it was like choice among jurisdictions or jurisprudence or something. Uh, Ah, uh, we'll have to, okay, I'll go back. <laughs> Thank God we're reporting it. Um, I'm sorry, I'll go back and find the new word. Um, but perhaps uh, others hadn't heard that one before either. I think it was a word where you pluralized different um, legal. Oh, by juralism. That's it, yeah. Yes, what is so that? Um, to explain that, it's in Canada, and also as well in the US, there's federalism. So um, there's the state sort of interpretation versus federal sort of there's state courts and federal courts. Um, but in Canada as well, we also have two legal systems within the country. So in Quebec specifically, um, it follows civil law, even though the broader sort of Canada is common law. So because of that, it's two sort of parallel systems and sometimes interpretations in a civil law system. So civil law in the same context as European civil law, they have sort of different um, understandings and interpretations of legal terms. So they're saying that if there are different legal concepts that are um, in the civil system versus the common system, there might be competition in that regard. So in addition to translation issues quite like straightforwardly between languages, it's also translation of concepts that is at hand. So that's kind of what I'm discussing. 
Interesting. Thank you so much. Um, Brian Ulysny, um, you have your digital hand raised. You're up. I do, and now I have my physical hand raised as well. <laughs> I don't know why my, do you see this weird uh, circle thing? Snapchat. Yeah, you've become a circle. Oh, is that a Snapchat thing? You know what? I, I installed that stupid cat uh, <laughs> filter and that must have done it. At least I'm not a, a cat right now. Anyway, you know, <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, but we but we do have good audio. So uh, you can go ahead. So uh, so first comment one is that um, in the paper and in and, and what you just read you, uh, you say, you know, you talk about logic syntax. But um, I think the important thing about logic is that it has a semantics. That's why we care about it. And um, meaning that you know, logics have both a, um, for something to count as a logic, it, well, first, you know, first class logics have soundness and completeness proofs. Soundness meaning that, uh, you know, so logics have rules of inference and um, the soundness proofs mean that everything that you can derive by those inference rules, if the premises are true, the conclusions are true and completeness that everything that um, should be derived is derivable by the inference rules. And so that's that's what's important about having a logic. It's not just another syntax, another formalism. We're not just translating, mm -hmm. you know, um, um, English into, uh, you know, Excel macros or something, because those mm -hmm. don't really have a semantics. Um, logics mm -hmm. have semantics. That's why we care about them. But the other thing is, um, I, I was making asking, going to ask a question that maybe yes, please. The um, the uh, it's not the legislation itself that should be translated into logic, but and and where people have an opportunity to review this is, you know, the, there's the rulemaking process is done by the agencies that that implement these things. And there's generally a public comment period. And that would be a great time for them to say, OK, here's how we're formalizing this legislation as code. And then the public has a chance to do essentially a code review and say, oh, you know, you didn't quite get this part right or this, this, there's this uh, exception that you didn't handle here or whatever. And um, rather than relying on the legislators to do this, which, you know, I doubt that they're capable of, but um, at the agency and rulemaking level, I think this is much more likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. I think those are fantastic comments. Um, when I speak about logical syntax, I think uh, I refer actually in the very narrow sense that's been um, purported by Rudolf Carnap, who had the specific idea um, that you know, we need to use symbols in the same way that sort of math has the symbols to represent concepts. So it's almost a removal or a pulverization out of um, semantics. Uh, so I do recognize, of course, that logic itself has this important component of semantics. Here, um, I turn specifically to kind of this notion that you're just a manipulating symbols in a sense. Um, and this is also something that uh, Layman Allen tried to do in a later piece uh, where he tries to use uh, symbolic logic for drafting. Um, how I see it is that he's proven actually that you can increase the clarity, but it's more in the sense that it's a metric to measure how clear legislation is as opposed to use for drafting from the start. Um, with your second comment, I certainly agree. I think that there should be um, openness uh, for people to comment um, and especially how, uh, I guess, uh, how lobbyists in many ways go about um, trying to make changes in legislation. Um, I think some of the interesting things at this point is that rules as code suggests that there should be everybody in the room. So beyond legislators, there should be programmers and that there's a sort of a combination of minds in a way to produce this type of legislation. So sometimes even, so this is an exercise in parallel drafting. So they're saying that um, the methodology will enable, you know, these comments and that interpretations will already accommodate for other perspectives. So 
but sort of correction and being able to edit the legislation at a later date after the initial draft is also an important consideration. Cool, thanks. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, we're now creating our own little uh, common law of this new series uh, with <laughs> the following practice and custom. After you have paid the table stakes of raising your hand and, and posing a question or idea, you've earned the right to not be muted again and to <laughs> continue the conversation. Also, I'm not sure how to mute people after taking them. Oh, uh, but you, you're permitted to mute yourself if you want to, Brian. Okay, and so now next up we have Brendan Marr. Uh, you're up. Um, let your ideas flow. Great. Can everybody hear me? Megan, uh, wonderful talk. I have uh, two quick points, and then I'd like to comment on on what you have presented. Uh, first, to continue on with uh, Brian Ulysses' comments about completeness. Uh, this is actually really important, and it you know it it harkens back to the, the constructs of a, a Turing machine that is um, a, a finite, uh, and th these are very important things to look at in terms of you know building your models in terms of a not just a uh, legal encoding, but one which is uh, complete and comes to a finite state. So th those are important things to keep in mind. Two, uh, I love your idea of, I forget the exact word there, uh, by, by jurisdiction presence. <laughs> I'm not sure what by, that by was. By juralism. <laughs> by juralism. We're gonna need that when it comes to merging traditional law and space law. So I wanna hear a paper from that, <laughs> about that. <laughs> But to comment on 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 your 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 uh, main body of discussion, what is important to think about is the the finite set of these operators. And you chose a word in your example. If you can refresh my memory, that would be helpful. What was the word you used in your example? Uh, unless, or... unless yes. So in 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 the, in the scope of legal documents. Uh, there are going to be, you know, roughly more or less a, a finite number of these words, which are, um, you know, how do I say, uh, ambiguous, right? Mm -hmm. Now there will be there will, there will be many more in the space, and those will be at the tails of the of the curves. But generally speaking, for most documents in specific areas, there's going to be a finite set. The question becomes first: How do we identify, you know, these finite set of mm -hmm. terms for a number of uh, documents, and then B, you know, looking at the the content of the documents themselves, and looking at how to take those content contents of clauses, and essentially from a computational standpoint, you know, bring them into hash tables, so like putting them into different buckets, yeah. and from that you can you know build all sorts of models, and um, I'm sure you're thinking about this. If not, we can discuss. It. Yeah, um, that's actually really fascinating because um, I actually had a response from a uh, legislative drafter when I talked about this. And she had mentioned to me that um, actually even in natural language and when you're drafting legislation, there's already a finite set of operators or a finite set of vocabulary that they have to use and that they're not allowed to introduce vocabulary or terminology outside of this set. So I think it will be interesting in sort of comparing, comparing finite operators almost to see and identifying actually specifically where has ambiguity existed. And a lot of times there's ambiguity that's unintentional versus intentional. Um, le most legislative drafters are of the um, idea that unintentional ambiguity is what exists because there is already this finite operator that intentional ambiguity isn't really necessarily there. But at the same time, this is a Canadian perspective. Um, in the US, I know that intentional ambiguity is sometimes incorporated just to <laughs> defer to authority and defer responding at the moment. So I certainly think that um, your suggestion and kind of looking at um, these finite operators, that is something that we certainly have to do. And I think that there's going to be going forward um, almost a matching process. Um, there isn't such thing, I think, as perfect translation, but at least there might be a potential uh, conceptual matching between finite operators uh, comp computationally and in the natural language when it comes to legislative drafting. 
Thank you again. I think you're sorry. I'm on mute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is like the the plague of our age. Is uh, you're on mute. <clears throat> Renita, um, you have your digital hand raised um, and you now have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Your, your comments are fascinating. I read your, um, your remarks briefly and there's so much information to unpack. One question I had was regarding what you mentioned about the two modes of uh, federal and state laws by dualism. <laughs> um, that you see in Canada and in, in the Quebec province. And I'm wondering if that system is working well and if there are specific cases there that show how it is actually advantageous to have two kinds of laws running at the same time. Would it not be the same for certain aspects of machine readable legislation that we have many translations and perhaps in some niche area it would be beneficial to have multiple translations running at the same time for example on the phone i know that there is the bible app and there are so many different translations mm -hmm. that people can download and read um, and different groups of people gravitate to different translations uh, the gist might be the same, but there are some nuances that are manifest better in certain translations of others. And I'm wondering if machine readable legislation will, might in fact benefit from having multiple interpretations in some cases. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, I think to answer, I will go back to the bidiralism question after, but to answer first multiple translations and the benefits of having that. Um, that's in part why I raise the three models or how I see the three scenarios. And the reason is because in the first scenario, if it's just a coded version, um, it is an interpretation or a translation. So then it would add to sort of the benefit of having multiple translations because it does perhaps increase accessibility in many ways. Uh, and that's perhaps why, you know, there are multiple translations in, for example, the Bible where you have English, Spanish, French, um, Chinese maybe. Um, but I think that having a different translation and having, a trans having additional translations is different than having an extra authoritative document. And that's sort of where my distinction is and where I talk about the parallel alternative. And that's sort of what leads me into the bidiralism discussion. So in Canada, they have had efforts because um, it was sad to say that before there were just makeshift equivalents and you know attempts at making one-to-one uh, -one translation in a way, but it's almost, in many cases, it was, uh, I read it, <laughs> it was an English version that was drafted, and then somebody who knows French, who is just a, who is a translator without legal knowledge, had just, you know, converted it. And at times, legal concepts don't have the same conceptual similarities as we think they do. Um, so some things that they've tried to remedy is actually McGill University. Um, there's a new department called Jurolinguistics, where they actually focus very, very closely on conceptual, so integrating conceptual and linguistic translation together, which is why they've sort of merged the name Jurolinguistics. And that's sort of an area where they've tried to look at what exactly are parallels in um, different legal systems and how are we going to improve these translations so that going forward, if there are disputes that people are not necessarily being very strategic about which version that they're bringing to the court, that there are, you know, at some places, a level playing field, I guess, between um, versions. So I'm not sure if that answers your question fully, but thanks very much. Great. And I'm going to take uh, the um, co-moderator's privilege now to make a comment also about this topic before we move on to TMA. Um, and so uh, just weaving together a little bit, Brian Ulysses' observation about um, in the US what we call NPRMs or Notice of Proposed Rulemaking uh, when, we, when the, a, a um, regulatory agency um, is, uh, is forced to 
publish a draft of regulations in advance and provide mm -hmm. um, notice and uh, opportunity to comment. Um, it seems to me that, um, so I'm sorry, weaving that together with uh, what was just said now about multiple different ways to, to kind of do the matching. It seems to me that there, there are multiple ways, partly because there, is, there really isn't a one to one, one translation. There's somewhat different domain spaces. Um, yeah. Well, profoundly different in some cases. And that means when we come to the area of public law that there are fundamentally political questions about what are we ex trying to express and how do we express that? Um, and so we, we, we may be trying to express and, and expressing certain ways, certain things in natural language and certain other things in the realm of code as it emerges. And these uh, things must be debated and there will be alternatives. Mm -hmm. Those alternatives can be, uh, proposals can be published as draft in advance and they can be um, argued over. They can be amended. Um, people could prefer this or that code version mm -hmm. and ultimately voted upon and become mm -hmm. part of the, the formal law. But it, anyway, it strikes me that um, in sort of a similar spirit to when I said, why not all three? So too, with just the question of what is the translation or the, the instantiation in code of, of, mm -hmm. of, of, of public law, um, that, that, that itself it, it may be a way to establish which way to do it might itself be um, a political question. And luckily we have methods to resolve political questions. Like we, one of them is we can elect people, they can argue, they can vote, and then they can publish the answer in a law book, yeah. in this case, a code law book. So anyway, those are just some musings um, on that. Thank you so much. Um, what, a, what a fascinating uh, flash talk and, um, and a great opening to, to, the, to the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me as always. And thank you, Renita, Brendan, Brian, for such great questions and Daza, of course. Thank you. Okay, and so the fun doesn't stop. We actually have, uh, thanks in part because we're using the, the quick way to give ideas. Um, in, in other groups, you might still be hearing somebody kind of slogging through slides on their ideas, but no, no, we're doing flash talks so that we can get the kernel of the idea out quickly and have more time to, to discuss. Um, and so we have time for a second one. And, and our next flash talker is TMA Roguer. And um, TMA uh, is going to um, give us a flash talk on algorithmic sentencing. Um, TMA, you have the floor. Thanks, Daza. Hi, everyone. Um, like Daza said, I'll be talking about algorithmic, algorithmic sentencing. And similarly to Megan, uh, this will be a reprise from my talk during the computational law course. And specifically, I'll be talking to you guys today about how algorithmic sentencing uh, will affect our judicial processes, particularly the trust and the standards that apply to the role, role of a judge as more and more countries like Estonia and Singapore start experimenting with using algorith algorithmic sentencing in small claims courts. And even though what's happening right now in this space is going on all over the world for the sake of simplicity, we'll be keeping our discussion to the US justice system. So a few years ago, a study revealed that US judges disproportionately sentence black defendants to longer punishments than their white counterparts. And while it's unsurprising that human bias is to blame, finding a judicious solution proves surprisingly fraught. Although algorithmic sentencing seems like a good fix, carefully coded sentencing programs can be used to unveil judges, sometimes flawed human programming. And these sorts of, um, this ability to point out flaws should be able to help avoid situations like when an Ohio judge went against the recommendations of both the defense counsel and the state prosecutor and condemned a 55 year old black woman to 65 years in prison for nonviolent theft. The technology is still nascent and it's prone to certain issues. For example, the data used to program code is often incomplete or incorrect, which can bias outcomes and like Megan talked about, there's ambiguous legal drafting, which in the US can be intentionally left to the interpretation of judges, our higher powers, 
And this complicates writing legislation that algorithm, algorithms can process. But I believe that it's reasonable to assume these issues will eventually be addressed. Um, but then we have this larger question that remains. Will algorithmic sentencing negatively impact Americans faith in the US legal system? Because the efficacy of our legal system hinges on the confidence Americans have in its ability to deliver justice. And while most Americans have collectively agreed to entrust the deliverance of justice to judges in spite of their shortcomings, it's unclear whether this negotiated custody will persist in light of evolving technological alternatives. So what I wanted us to talk about today was to think about three things. To think about what the trade-offs are between the current legal system in the United States and a potential future algorithmic legal system. And second, to think about whether the fairness gained through algorithms would be worse, would risk relinquishing human accountability that we gain from judges. And thirdly, would a shift in an accountability from judges to algorithms affect the stability of our currently reliable, albeit imperfect legal system? Okay, so with that, I'll open up the floor for our discussion. Thank you. Robot judges, anybody? <laughs> How would you like your liberty to depend upon that? I guess as, as like a segue between what Megan talked about and what I just presented, I think, you know, Megan mentioned how in the US, in a, um, we defer to our authorities, right, to help interpret our uh, rule of law. And I think that this question of how who we want to be interpreting our laws, that that question is something that I think is a conversation that has to happen right now. So I'm interested to hear what you guys think in terms of whether or not we think algorithms are a better arbiter of justice than flawed human beings, or if there's value in a person at the end of the day, making moral judgments on our society. Okay, Renata, I uh, think. Did I unmute Renata? I don't know. Uh, hello, everyone. <sighs> How's everyone? I hope everyone's fine. Thank you, Timmy, for your uh, amazing talk. And as well as Megama. Well, I think that algorithm sentencing will be very valuable to those questions that uh, where context isn't as relevant as uh, a few objective facts. And I say that from a perspective of a judge who's been working with tax law on uh, on a few, uh, for for one year now, and in, in cases where context is not relevant, it's pretty clear to me that decisions should actually be automated by algorithm because we, we wouldn't have to actually use all entire powers and resources doing things that are pretty much automated. But there are other situations where context is really relevant. And I think that in, in those cases, uh, the human presence in the decision process is really relevant and that would actually make a, uh, a consistent difference in the final justice of a, de of a decision. So that's just uh, a, a remark I'd like to take on that, on that aspect of your questions. Uh, may, 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 may I intervene for a moment, TMA, uh, yeah. to ask um, uh, Her Honor, um, if, if you could please... <laughs> Um, maybe give us just an example or two of times uh, in in your administration of of, uh, of ta or adjudication of tax cases where context was relevant and where context wasn't relevant, just so we can kind of get onto the same wavelength with you. Okay, Thanks. sure. Uh, okay, so here in Brazil, we've got uh, a, a specific tax for vehicle possession. Okay, so if it's like uh, someone who's actually delayed the tax. Uh, the payment of the tax or something like that, that, would, that wouldn't be as relevant as, for instance, um, a benefit where people with disabilities have here to actually buy their vehicles ch uh, cheaper and um, uh, in special conditions and actually uh, pay less tax. So uh, now the law has actually changed and uh, there aren't those benefits anymore. 
and there's actually now a judicial discussion concerning this these situations where we can where we actually need to evaluate the nature of the disabilities the nature of the benefit and what are what we are actually looking forward and what we are actually trying to trying to reach with the decision and with the law thank you um oh, okay uh, Tiemi, did you have any any thoughts or remarks on that yeah, I was thinking this reminds me of, you know, where judicial interpretation comes in, in the U.S. with due process and just thinking through, you know, how, like, there's this big scope of, how, I, I think you know about this a lot more than I do, but no, my no, understanding no, is that there's all these different ways, you know, there's like the strict adherence, intermediate, I forget the first one, but anyway, there's all these different ways to interpret what constitutes due process in the United States and what our rights are constitutionally. And that interpretation, one, it differs, like a very controversial um, application of due process is with affirmative action. And the fact that, and then there's, I forget which justice it was who talked about how the interpretive of, of due process and how it applies to affirmative action not only depends on the interpretation of the you know, written laws and how we interpret due process, but also the societal context of what's considered, yes. you know, within the scope of, nor of normal at a certain point in time in history. And so I, yeah, I guess thinking about just how the Disability Act in Brazil and for, you know, the, um, I forget what it was, tax tax code? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. it's a tax benefit. Tax benefit, uh, yeah. yeah. Just like how that will, sh whether or not like that also is a situation where it will shift with time, you know, as, what constitutes a, as a disability changes or what the benefits end up actually being. Yes, actually that's being discussed right now, but um, I think that uh, concerning due process of law and the procedural laws and uh, specifics when we're talking about uh, actually how a process will develop inside the judicial system, we can think of automating and judicial sentencing and maybe having a few decisions automated, but not those where we can, uh, once again, where context is relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, here in Brazil, we've got like uh, something that actually approaches us to common law. Uh, for instance, when we have like several uh, similar judgments, we are obliged to actually apply those judgments. So when justice uh, decides one thing, we just have to follow it through when it reaches a, a few of uh, a few requirements. So, but for us to change that, we need to, to take into consideration like um, the context and the evolution of society and things like that. And I think that maybe in those cases, algorithm decisions would actually uh, prevent us from that discussion, yeah. from overruling and distinguishing and things like that. So I think that uh, we should be just a bit careful. Automation is, is really important. We need it. It's just something that we've taken too long to actually use it, but we can't forget co context. Thank Otherwise you. we'll just have, uh, uh, the law will be just static and that's not what we're looking for. Amen. Um, you can almost imagine. I'm going. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm abusing my moderator's privilege, and I, and I know Brian has something to say as well. And, and then we've got two hands raised. But I'm, here goes. I'm abusing it. Um, it, it, it makes me think. Um, in the future, one thing you can imagine it, it is uh, some laws, like we'll hear about next month um, again from Andrew when he talks about strict liability in the context of automated legal entities as a legal place uh, thing. You know, like just like possession. Of a, of a drug sometimes just like that's the only question it wasn't your intent or other circumstances just a fact question did you possess it like so maybe it's a question of, it was in my pocket was it on the table near me uh, but still it's like a yes no possession um and uh some of these can be simplified by the legislature making rules yeah. that are very um you know kind of perfect for algorithms, others like due process and civil liberties and living concepts of justice, not so much. But on the other side of the coin is litigants. And so you can imagine even with something that theoretically has, you know, or had a clear interpretation like possession in one situation in the future when things are digital, 
um, maybe this is now up for a context debate again. Um, and so you can almost imagine a new class of civil or criminal procedure hearings like a context hearing, like, Your Honor, I object, I, I, I require a context hearing. Okay, do your filings as yeah. to why you believe context matters. And then you have it out with the other side and then there's a ruling whether context matters or not. But anyway, this context thing, I think is just, uh, I'm so glad um, that, that, that we brought this up. I think that we're surfacing something that's going to become a, a key feature of computational law. So with that, I believe we have some, some new moderator privileges from Brian. Yeah, so I, uh, one of the things, I, I've got one point and then kind of an open-ended question that, um, I want to pose and the the point is that when you think about <clears throat> the efficacy of you know something that's fully automated versus something that's analog um i think it's easy to get caught in this false binary of those are the two choices um i think there's a a middle path where it's like the augmented um and i know we talk a lot about you know not being C3PO but being in the Iron Man suit where you're the the thing that you are trying to do is augmented by the technology and not replaced or or uh, eliminated by the technology and there have been case studies that have shown with for example certain types of legal work that you know if you train a contract system like LawGeeks did to review non-disclosure agreements, you can automate and find, you know, 95% of the issues that might arise, which is better than, you know, if you allow humans to do it and only get like 88% of the issues that might arise. But when you use the two together and you combine the two together, you get 97, 98% of the issues that arise, which is higher than each of those alone individually. And so the question that I want to pose is, if we begin to think about this concept of automated justices or automated sentencing as one that is more of a, you know, how do we supplement the abilities of judges? How do we augment the abilities of judges in a way that empowers them to, you know, get to closer to that 98% instead of the 88% or the 92%? You know, what does that begin to look like? And I don't know that I have a, uh, an answer. I don't know. That was, that's the end of my, uh, <laughs> my yeah, question. I think you have to now give like the factual, definite 100% answer. You're well, up. I, so I'll, I'll throw a link into the chat. Um, but I think one beginning step, uh, something that would be an easy thing to do would be like what uh, Gabe Tenenbaum and Jameis and Dempsey proposed in their article that they published with us. Um, may it please the bot, which is uh, machine readable judicial opinions that allow us to at least to begin to contextualize some of these uh, decisions that are being made in a way that would, you know, support applications built on top of them. Any um, thoughts or reflections on that? Uh, and we, we do have two, two more um, that I think we can squeeze in from Bruna and Brendan, but Okay, um, so we'll let your um, contribution stand as its own uh, contribution, Brian, for now. Um, and uh, Bruna, um, you, you have your hand raised. Um, you may unmute. Hey, and hi everyone. So I actually have a question that would be, that is aligned with what, what Brian just posed and gave an example. Because when I, when I think about um, automating, uh, sentencing, automating, automation. Uh, I, I actually also think about the, the first text that was, was, was assigned for the computational law workshop for an algorithm, um, let me just check the name, a perspective on algorithm, on legal algorithms. And I, I, I think when I think of the missing components of the, current legal production. I think, yeah, those steps are definitely desirable, but I have the same um, questions about how it is, uh, how can we actually make uh, this hybrid if we're not to, if we're not to uh, 
sorry, I'm just trying to <laughs> to uh, to formulate in my head. It, if we're not to uh, s uh, replace, if we're not to replace humans, and especially uh, and also in the metrification, for example, and evaluation, if the the goals are being uh, fulfilled in a in a in a legal algorithm. So if we're not to replace and if we are to augment, uh, is there like a, an example of an effective um, hybrid system? Because when I think, for example, in hanging systems that could be used, uh, those, uh, I think the, the, the evaluator, the, the people who is the, making the decision is not going to, to check all, the, all the, the final, all the pages and all the options, for example, and they are going to to actually just see the first ones because they are uh, relying on the they are confident about the computer ranking uh, decision, for example. So I think I have a serious serious uh, question, uh, and I always get uh, really uh, anxiety about that when I think about uh, effective hybrid systems. And since I don't have uh, that many experience. I would like to hear if there is an example of uh, a contextual application of a uh, legal algorithm or a sentencing algorithm that is effectively uh, hybrid and not just uh, it, it says it, it should be a hybrid system, but it relies on the on the computer after all. Thank you. Yeah. If someone has an answer, I actually have a quick comment to add to what Bruna said before any answers are provided. Well, please can. I, what? Yeah, pl please oh, do. It's, okay. uh, it's your show. Um, so I oftentimes think about, think about the tendency for hum in human, closed human systems uh, for entropy to happen. And I think that what I worry about oftentimes is in an ideal world, we would use you know, algorithms as a tool to augment our decision making. But because of this, you know, because of entropy, we tend to just default, you know, I have a, um, an email program that I use that helps sort my emails for me. And rather than actually going through and tagging things, I've just defaulted to just trusting whatever the heck goes through the filters. And it's going to tell me something spam, I believe it. And I've discovered recently that that isn't always the case and things get thrown into the wrong bucket all the time. And that this is something that's really not that important, right? My emails. But I think that I sometimes think about what, what happens. Um, yeah, like what would happen in a judicial system. And I, I also, another point that I'll bring up is, you know, in the US, there's been a lot of, a lot of rec more recent studies into how our judiciary even works and like the decision-making process that happens. And, it's sort of highlighted that judges are humans, right? Judges think very critically and like they're, they, they go through a lot of schooling and it's just what they do is incredible, but they're still humans and mistakes happen. And rather than having these studies point out, oh, here, here are some places that we can augment judicial, like human decision-making with programs, what's ended up happening is a sort of decay of trust in, in judges. And I think that that's that dichotomy almost between like this potential for making the entire system better and this potential for sort of completely decaying the trust that we have in the system and just collapsing our system. It's just something I, I, yeah, I think about a lot and I don't really have a clear answer for how we can improve it, but just know that, you know, debates might help highlight, you know, our, through idea flow highlight some, yeah, potential solutions. Okay, anyway, Brian, I know you have something to say and Brendan too, so. I, I think that was a really good uh, kind of like framing of where we could go with a lot of these, uh, you know, with this augmentation, um, because certainly, you know, there's something that is lost uh, in this translation process, like tying it all back together. Um, you know, there's something that's lost in if, if we just completely rely on translations and um, the one example that is easy to point to is if you look at Google Translate, you know, it relies on um, context that is, you know, completely divorced from, you know, whatever the larger situation that you have is. And um, that ties back into some of the work that 
Douglas Hofstadter's done on machine translation. Um, and then, um, you know, I think, you know, losing the, it, it, we have to make it so that the goal is elevating the human and, you know, just re reducing the potential liabilities. And that's all I'll say so that we can move forward. And then you're up next. Oh, great. Tammy, just a wonderful discussion. Uh, it's all very important. And while you're focused specifically on real space and, and you know, meat space for uh, lack of a better word, um, it is really, really important discussion for all things made out of atoms and, and also all things made out of bits. And to carry further on what Brian is talking about, the nail that hits, uh, or the hammer that hits the nail on the head is uh, the idea of context. Which, and where I think your work is really important is uh, exactly in this and the constructs of, and it's been mentioned before, uh, simulation. And where what you're uh, doing and how you're approaching things, um, how that meets the world of simulation. And beyond being able to simulate things, another very important part of this context switching uh, is the uh, world of oracles. And this is something that is going to come up uh, by and large, I think specifically uh, in the Wyoming jurisdiction in terms of uh, their court of chancellery, because we have this situation where we have automated smart contracts. And then the question is, you know, at what point does that break down? At what point do we actually seek to have human intervention and interpretation? So we have the case that we have uh, two different groups, two different systems, two different uh, areas of research. One is from the world of atoms and one is from the world of uh, from bits and smart contracts. And they're, they're kind of coming together and where they meet in the middle is this transition of, or questions of how do you do the handoff in terms of reinterpreting the law uh, in a different, how do I say, um, systematic context, right? Going from algorithms and then switching over and saying, okay, this is not working for what we're doing here. We now need to switch over, switch over to oracles or uh, human intervention. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. That's actually, I love that framing of it and it's useful to think about it in that way. Okay, thank you everyone. I'll hand it back to Daza, but I really appreciate your comments. It was really incredible. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, um, we truly do live in the worlds of atoms and bits at, at, at the smallest increment of, of um, matter and information. Um, and so thank you very much, everybody, um, to our speakers and Brian, and to, of course, all of you in our uh, growing community of, of, um, of members and, uh, and of idea um, crafters. And so uh, we hope that you will join us next month um, on the last Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern for the next episode of Idea Flow. Uh, and we'll have, among other things, uh, the flash talk from Andrew on automated and autonomous legal entities. And we'll have a second flash talk. And we have some really interesting people in the pipeline for um, May and June. Um, and if you have any suggestions for speakers or if you yourself would like to give a flash talk, um, please feel free to, to let us know. There is a form for this that you can also share with others. Um, we wanted, I wanted to keep it to people that had been in the class this first time just to get our flow. I believe we have our flow. And so we're gonna open the doors in the future. That form is at computationallaw.org. Um, and uh, that's on GitHub. There may be a uh, secure, uh, I need to hook up the, the um, SSL certificate. So you might get a terrifying security message right now, but that's where the Google form is anyway. And, uh, and so thanks again, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you next month on IdeaFlow. Until then, we wish you well. Bye.